All right, I think it's time to commence. There's a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we remember that uh, Tuesday is our reading class next door at the Fellowship Hall. And Wednesday, we have our continued study on the covenant. And also next Sunday is, a, uh, uh, is our potluck uh, service. Uh, is our potluck next door uh, on our third Sunday of the month. I have a card that was given to us uh, at Grace here this morning. Um, if you'd like to take a look at it, it's from Cheryl. It says, uh, thank you for the food and the prayers and the calls in regards to her mishap with her finger that she got caught in the doorway. And uh, I know that's pretty tough because I remember when I lost this, it was a uh, tough ordeal one one day but we'll all survive and I know she's doing better and feeling better at this point so with that let me begin with our reading of our word and we'll continue on shout with a joy shout with joy to the Lord all all the earth worship the Lord with gladness come before him sing with joy acknowledge the Lord is God he made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into the courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. He is faith, he is unfail, his unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation, and that includes us today. Thank you, dear Father, for the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you, Father, for, uh, for our opportunity to fellowship together this morning in, in, worship, in this worship hour. Be with us this morning. Give us the right mind and attitude as we listen to the word and as we sing our songs of praise to you. Thank you for your love that you've given us and shown us through your son who died on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I had it right. Good morning. morning. My name's Ken. I'm new here. <laughs> Miss, missed y'all. Missed y'all. It was. It's been a three week ordeal or so. Or something like Anyway, it's good to be back. Good to be back. Great temperature outside. Everybody enjoying this? Oh, man. And next Sunday, I heard like 40. Next Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. So, happy, happy. We'll, we'll, we'll get the heater turned on. Maybe it'll work. So. Anyway, anyway, God's good. I love when that seasons actually do change. <laughs> it's it's great to have some fall. So all right, let's stand. We're gonna praise God. We're gonna meet with Him. I'm here to find you, 
Joy. 
seated. I like that song, Trading My Sorrows. That pain's just temporary. so much in, in front of you, so many things in our life. And Lord, we just don't want that to be true. We want you to be the number one thing that we worship. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, that came to this earth to show us how to live, came to be our Savior, died upon that horrible cross, arose on the third day, resurrected, glorious. Thank you so much for your perfect plan of redemption, that you have a plan. No matter what happens, it will come true. We thank you and we love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. If you'll take your scripture this morning and turn to 2 Thessalonians in chapter 3. and We're going to pick up in verse 6 and we're going to work down through verse 15. The text this morning is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verses 6 through 15. A large portion of scripture. Uh, the emphasis of the context this morning is the same. And so I don't want to break it up. Uh, we're going to hit the highlights. I uh, can't do a study on 
the entire work of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation on the Christian virtue of work. Uh, We're going to stay in this context as much as we can. But I just want to tell you, the Word of God has much to say about work and our Christian attitude toward work. In our society in which we live in the Western world, uh, even amongst the religious of our society, work has almost become a curse word. I just want to tell you that this is not anything new in Scripture. In the Greek or Roman world, slaves did the work. Free men did the frolicking, did the philosophy, did the activity of uh, entertainment. Even the Jews uh, really despised work. And so this is not something that Paul is addressing and saying this is just at the church at Thessalonica. If you just look at the Pauline epistles, he touched on work in every single epistle. Our mindset toward, our duty in, what needs to be attributed to work when we go to work, an activity of responsibility, an activity of accountability, but the framework by which Paul is going to fashion this today is, it's not laborious, though labor is involved, it's a Christian virtue that ought to be embraced as though God is for us. We look at work and we think it's because of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 that all of a sudden work came on the scene. Is that true according to Scripture? I want you to look at something just as a foundational truth about work from the very beginning, the book of beginnings. I want you to take your Scripture and I want you to go back to Genesis in chapter 2. In Genesis in chapter 2, I want you to drop down we have the, the first of the creation of man and woman in purpose. We see the creation in chapter 1. We see the order. We see what is commanded of them to go and subdue, have dominion over, reproduce. We see that. But we get real specific in chapter 2. And one of the purposes is to work. And we are way before we get to chapter 3. This is God's purpose from the beginning. And he said, well, Rob, where do you get that? Well, I want you to see it in Scripture. I don't want to just tell you about it. I want us to learn together this morning. He says, then the Lord God, in verse 15 of chapter 2, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden. It could have ended right there, and we could have said, oh, neat. They just went there, you know, to have bonbons and lemonade. That's not what the passage says. It says he took them into the garden, now look at it, to cultivate it and keep it. Guys, I don't know if you know anything about farming, but you can't just show up and wish a field into harvest. That's an impossibility. I grew up on a ranch, and you can't just put a bull with a cow and not have some kind of assistance when it that cow gives birth to that calf there has to be work involved you can't just take a teacher into an atmosphere into a school and say carte blanche you do whatever you want to there's no training there's no expectation there's no time frame i can't take a person into the post office and say the mail has to get out and it doesn't matter what time it is you just do whatever you want to Think about beekeeping. Is there not structure and accountability to beekeeping? And we look at this and we say, well, is that because of the curse? Absolutely not. (laughs) But yet in our society, that's the way it's viewed. Guys, it should be an honor that God has given us opportunity to cultivate the soil and to keep it, to have a job to have purpose in life, to have work that makes sense in the society of benefit, not just for myself, but for my co-human person that's in my home or in my community or in the world at large. And so when we see this, no doubt God ordained work in creation from the beginning. You say, well, then what changed? Well, go to chapter three. I'll show you it wasn't work that was ordained. Guys, work became cursed in the soil. 
it became laborious to do the work that God had asked them to do. Drop down to uh, verse 17 of chapter 3. Then to Adam he said, this is, this is God, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. In other words, if you want to eat, you got to work. We're going to see it again. But thorns and thistles, but here's going to be the reality. But thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Now, you want to talk about a sobering statement in Scripture. Here's what you have to look forward to. You were conceived, you were born to work, and all of a sudden you just die and you just go back to dirt. And if we look at it in that context, we don't really see the value and the beauty of it, but Paul's going to put a whole different flash on this for us. He's going to let us see there's beauty and there's cause and there's effect to working diligently as unto the Lord that we ought to see as a Christian virtue that we ought to embrace. Guys, you've heard this before, this little uh, statement. If you ever find a job that you enjoy, you will never work a day in your life. Can I just tell you something? I think if you ever find a job that you really enjoy, you will work harder at it than anybody else around you. I do think you will work. And I think you, is there enjoyment in it at times? <laughs> is there difficulty in it? Thistles and thorns are hard to get rid of. Just put a yard in, in West Texas. People say, well, the only thing it takes to have a yard is just water and fertilizer, really? I think it takes more weed killer than anything. But folks, the idea here is that the mindset for, for Christianity and for the virtue of the Christian to walk through life in a worthy manner that glorifies God is that we have a right perspective of work. We have a right understanding of why we work because we have become so skewed in our society, it's almost like we, we've come to the place where it's because you're having to go to work every day, you did something wrong. Because you can't go to the Bahamas and you can't go on a cruise. Somehow, some way, you didn't do something right. Can I just tell you, that, that's not the perspective of Scripture. Normal Christianity, not radical Christianity, normal Christianity says, I will embrace the commandment of God to work and I will enjoy every single day God has given me, even in my work, even in the difficulty of the day, even when things don't go my way, even though the sweat is pouring down my brow, I will honor God in all that I do in the work that he's called me to. You say, well, okay, Rob, I see that in, in Genesis. That's Old Testament. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 10. I'm trying to build a case here, so just stay, stay with me before we read the text. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, I want you to drop down to verse 31. Now, the Apostle Paul has been talking about uh, avoiding Israel's mistakes and Christian conduct and uh, the lawful and profitable thing to do. And then all of a sudden, it's almost like he takes a station break. And he says, I just want to throw this in. Look at verse 31. He goes, I, I, I'm not going to list everything that would glorify God, but I'm going to just give it in a nutshell. I'm going to give you an overview. Whether then you eat or drink, and then he says, you know what, I'm not going to list this. Whatever you do, <laughs> you pick it. Whatever you do, how should I do it? Do all to the glory of God. He says, how about just the sustenance of life? How about just sustaining life itself? The physical reality. What are you going to have to do to do that? Well, I've got to eat and drink. He says, okay, let's just go to the basics of life, the fundamentals of life. Eating and drinking. How should I do that? Well, to the glory of God. And he says, oh, but here's the deal. It's not just about the basal things. It's not just about the fundamental things. How about whatever you do? 
So people will say to me, well, well, Rob, should I be about this or should I be about that? Will it honor God or not? If it honors God, do it as unto God. Have God glorified in it. Is it to you as a believer the paramount ideology of thinking that I want God put on display in everything I do? If that's my heart and that's my desire, you are squarely in the will of God. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. We care more about the title than we do the work. Well, I'm a this and I'm a that. Really, what about the guy that's not that? Or what about the lady that's not that or this? Is there not any honor in that? According to Scripture, it's the position of the heart and the desire of the eye, the pursuit of the eye that really glorifies God. Would I do it as unto God? Folks, the Christian ought to be the hardest working person on the job site. You should never have to ask the Christian to pick up their tool and go to work. We ought to be the first ones there and we ought to be the diligent one while we're there and if need be, we, ought to need, we should stay till it's done. And somebody else may get to define what done means, but I'm going to stay hooked till it's finished. We don't quit. We don't find an easy way out when the thorns and the thistles rear their ugly head. And when the heat's 110 and I'm sweating down my brow and I'm looking for an exit and I'm looking for an excuse, but there's work to be done. Christians ought to be the ones that stay in the trenches until it's over. In Exodus, we know that God commanded work. And I'm not going to go there, but in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 9, it says, here's the reality of humanity. Six days you are to labor. And on the seventh, you are to rest. And then he takes it back to creation. For in six days, you don't think God works? <laughs> In six days, he created all that was created. And on the seventh, he rested. God's not opposed to you resting. He has no problem if I show up at your house this afternoon and your feet are up on your coffee table and you're sound asleep in your favorite chair. That's not the issue. But when we go to work, we work as unto God. And we are diligent in our labor because that's what glorifies God most. Well, we have a problem at Thessalonica. You say, Rob, why don't you say that? Because this is the third time he's addressed this with this church. In chapter, in First Thessalonians, really three, four, and five, but four and five, he addressed this issue with them in great detail. And then turns right around in 2 Thessalonians, and he's going to give probably the clearest dissertation about work and his motivation and his incentives in all the scripture. We have a problem at Thessalonica about work. And you say, well, Rob, what's it based in? Why, why do you think that Paul's having to address this for the third time? Well, it can be culturally bound. I've already told you the greco roman world, and they were mainly converted Greeks. They had an issue with work. It was beneath them. Only slaves did the labor and the intensity of the labor in their society. The rest of them sat around and they philosophized and they were just about entertainment. Guys, there's not a single place in history that you see that the Colosseums in the Greco-Roman world weren't the greatest accomplishment in architecture in their communities. What was that for? It was for entertainment. Guys, does it take a rocket scientist to figure this out? Drive to any community and look at the heartbeat of the community. Go to the football stadium in West Texas and tell me that we have not taken on that same idolatry in America. I'm riding with a missionary man in Atlanta, Georgia. I was one of the breakout session speakers and he was the keynote. And the man that was putting this on was a pastor friend of mine in the Atlanta area. And he says, hey, you want to go with me uh, to the airport to pick up our guest speaker? South African had come out of, survived the Sudanese raids 
was one of these that only God could have caused the survival of this man. Not only in salvation, but just in physical life. He was riddled through his whole body with, uh, with shots, bullet wounds. How this man is alive is only by the good grace of God. We're coming into Atlanta. He's in tow. He's sitting actually right beside me. And we go by the stadium of the Falcons. And he looks at me and he says, a place of worship? And I said, for some. And he goes, God's spoken there? They can fill that stadium? When God is lifted up? And tears well up in his eyes. He's so excited. And I said, no. Football. And he goes like this with his foot. Football? Soccer to him. I said, no, 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 no. Football. Full metal jacket football. (laughs) Bodies flying. Small car wrecks after every snap. Full fight. Controlled. He goes, oh, American football. And I said, yes. And he turns his head toward the window. And tears are now rolling down his face. And he says, idolatry. Idolatry. And I thought, man. Took a man from South Africa who's not duped in religiosity of what's normal in Christianity. Folks, who do we serve? And for what would we stand? Guys, I work with people just like you. I hear more about the Friday night football game than I do about the glory of God being personified. Should you be proud of your children? Sure. Could they be the quarterback of the football team? Sure. Sure. Folks, where's your heart bent when it really matters? She said, Rob, why are you telling us that? Can I just tell you something to you young parents or parents in waiting? To grandparents that are sitting here? Or to those who live on a block or in an area that you see young children running around? You know the greatest thing we can do for the generation that's being raised in America today is to teach them how to work. You want to do the best for them? Teach them how to labor. Teach them that it means something. And it's more than the pride of life. It's a Christian virtue that is characteristic of every godly person who believes in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. I just want you to see in Scripture just a minute. I'm just going to give you a list. I'm not going to go through this. I promise you I'm going to get to verse 6 in a minute if you If you're staring at that and you've already wore it out, I'll get there in just a minute. But if you just talk about God alone in work, is he subject to the trials in work? No, not like we are. Does he expend energy? No. But we even refer to what he does in humanity and through history and even pre-foundationally before one created being was called into being. We call that the work of God. Why do we call it that? Because it's work. And God did it. I want want you just to listen to this for just a minute. Not only did he command the work, God himself set the example for work in creation, preservation of the saint, providence of care, judgment, redemption. How about Jesus Christ? Well, in redemption, building his church, he refers to as the work of God. God, interceding for the people of God, preparing a place in heaven for those who are in Christ Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. That preparation is a work of God in Christ Jesus. How about the work of the Holy Spirit? Convicting sinners of sin and unrighteousness, regeneration, that which precedes justification. Oh, how about this? The indwelling work of the Spirit to guide us into all truth. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. When I look at this in 
the pleasures of life and creation and the gift that should be elevated above just the mundane of life. I have to go to work. This is what God taught in Scripture. Think about this. What if we had this mindset as opposed to what we often see even in the Christian world? I have to go to work. What if I had this mindset? I get to go to work. Would your day be different? Maybe. (laughs) Would your attitude be different? Probably. (laughs) And this is what the Apostle Paul is challenging the church at Thessalonica. Have this mindset. I get to put God on display every day at work. God use me. Paul would say, even if I come to the place of exhaustion, that I've beat so hard against the wind, and I've run so hard in the race, I just want to be that person who doesn't beat in vain and doesn't run as though I have no destiny in mind. I just want to run toward Christ. He's the treasure. He's the trophy. Guys, this is a very difficult message to preach in America. I've preached this multiple times, and I was not invited back. So if I get invited back next week, man, you guys are the choir. Because this is just not taught. These are the passages that whenever we pick and choose what we want to teach, we don't pick and choose this. Because it deals with church discipline. It deals with true rebuke in Christ. It deals with our position as worker bees of the gospel. What do we do when somebody in our midst doesn't want to work and they've been called to work and they've been warned? What do we do with it? How do we operate in that system? Guys, if the church is truly going to be the church, these are the things that we have to hold at the highest watermarks. Well, let's begin the text. In verse 6, it reads this way, and I'm going to read down through verse 15, and then I'm going to take this and just bite size, and we're going to move through this fairly quickly. I've probably already preached my message. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which he received from me. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. But we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to do this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you that you might follow our example. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone will not work, neither let him eat. Hmm. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons, we command and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter... Take special note of that man and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. Verse 15. And yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Father, we thank you for this time together and we just rejoice in the fact that you give us this hour together to study your word in scripture. Folks, this is for us as believers, as the folks that have gathered in your name This is for us to learn today, and so if you don't teach us, we won't learn it. But Father, you are faithful to guide us into all truth through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're relying on him today to give us insight. Father, not just to gain the knowledge of this passage, but to apply it in faith that we might be found laborers in the field that would most glorify you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. In this passage, I want to show you six incentives to work. Six motivations of why work is a noble 
cause and virtue in Jesus Christ. The first thing comes in the word of a command. And we're going to look at it and it's going to seem extreme. A few of these are going to seem extremely negative. But in the context, they're not. So let me go back to why do I think that the church at Thessalonica had issues about work. Or some in the church had issues about work. Okay, we talked about the culture. Some were just lazy, okay? That's just the bottom line. But some really had a misunderstanding about the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church. And so because Paul in 1 Thessalonians talked about it being imminent and could happen at any moment, they looked at each other and said, then why would I go to work tomorrow if Christ is going to come anyway? Does it really matter that I show up? And Paul says, I don't know the time or the hour. I don't know the exact setting. I don't know what the day is, but I know what the day looks like. I'm telling you, strap on your boots, put on your working pants, get your gloves, and go to work. Even if he returns this morning, before you have your second cup of coffee, you go to work. And so whatever they were doing to justify not having a job, he says, not good enough. It's not adequate that we live that way. It is not becoming of you as a believer. So the first thing we're going to see is disfellowship. Now we're going to look at it as a church and go, really Rob, is this, is this really what we need to be about? If the Bible says it, it is what we need to be about. We're not here to negotiate and mince words and look at semantics. I'm going to show you in scripture this morning the first incentive of an able-bodied person Please don't take this to the outliers. Well, does that mean we never, you know, meet the needs of a widow or a widower or somebody in? No. If they're in need, we still go to them and aid and assist them. But when they choose as an able-bodied person not to have a job for their own sustenance, we have a problem. Well, look at it. Disfellowship is the first place Paul's going to operate from. An incentive to have a good work ethic. He says this in verse 6. Now, we, plural, us three guys that have come to you as missionaries, and now writing this letter, we command. This is not optional. We're not at Burger King anymore. You don't get it your way. He says this is an exhortation. This is a command. This is emphatic. This is what I'm telling you you need to be about at the church at Thessalonica. So we command you, and then he sets the context. Who's the audience? Look at it, and you tell me. (coughs) Brethren, he's speaking to the church, but he's speaking to the church from an authoritative position, not just apostolic, but look at the attention. He's talking to believers, and he says this. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, not because mama said that, or not because my boss said that, or not because the President of the United States said that, and there's some legislative council that met, and not because there's an ambassador sent from the government. He says, now I'm commanding you, I'm exhorting you, I'm making an absolute statement to you as a believer in Christ, birth from God. But I'm not coming in my own authority. I'm coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, does that just put a whole different slant on it? I mean, you think about your life and certain things being mandated to you and commanded of you, even when you were a kid growing up. Who said? I mean, I grew up around siblings, right? Hey, we got to go do such and such. And immediately, uh, we would look at my older brother, who was always the, the voice piece for my dad, and we would go, who said? If it was him, I'm not moving. (laughs) He can't tell me what to do. He's not my daddy. Guys, you've heard this. Kids running down the hall at church. And somebody has the audacity to say, hey, quit running in the church. You you can't tell me you're not my mom. (laughs) And they just keep running. He says, okay, time out. Before you ask who's telling me this, and before you ask, on whose authority am I going to say this, I'm telling you it's not from the preacher, it's from God. I commend you as a born-again child of God, straight from the boss, El Jefe has spoken. 
And he says, well, what is he telling us? Look at it. There's a disfellowship. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that God is, that you keep aloof. That is a continual, habitual lifestyle. Aloof means that you're going to stiff arm. You're going to avoid. You're going to disassociate, disfellowship from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. See that word unruly? Ellen will like this. It's a military term. All right. So we're all lined up as soldiers. We're in rank and order. And the commandment is that we start marching. And we have one dude that takes an about phase and he just starts walking out of rank. And everybody goes, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You broke rank. That's unruly. You can't do that. So he says, if, if this is the case, normal Christianity is we march to the beat of our Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lordship means that. I submit myself to the authority of God. That's lordship. All of a sudden, we have a person that decides unruly for them means I'm not going to get a job. They break rank. They walk on their own. He says, you know what? That's not what we taught. That's not the tradition that we taught. That's not the word that we spoke to you when we were with you. You do not have the right to break rank and not take a day job. Well, Paul, what do we do if they break rank? Aloof. Keep away. The word in the original text is stello in the Greek. To shun, to pull back from. Guys, oftentimes Matthew chapter 18, a very clear passage of scripture, Jesus teaching the church about church discipline. We have so mishandled that passage. But there's an order to the discipline of a brother or sister found in sin. And I just want to show you the four steps in that passage. We're not going to go to it and break that down because that's not what we're here to do. But the first step is, as a brother or sister in Christ, when we view another believer aloof, breaking rank, stepping out of order... We are to go, first privately, to that person. For what? Disfellowship? No. Restoration. If they repent and return, the scripture says you want a brother, a sister. They are repentant. It's over. Well, what happens if they don't? The very next thing is, after going, you take You take witnesses the second time. You go, you speak, and this time you have an order of two to three witnesses that say, this is right, we're asking you please, in restoration, would you please repent and return? Get back in rank. What happens on the third time? They don't when we go, they don't when we take. What happens thirdly? We tell. The church then is it's announced that we went privately, we went with witnesses, and no change. Still unruly. The church is to be notified, and aloof is the action of the church. That's step four. You go, you take, you tell, and lastly, you break. I want to show you this morning they're on step three I told you that first Thessalonians was the first two chapter four he made it clear I'm telling you this as a brother in Christ the next time he calls them to work and they don't do it is in chapter five of first Thessalonians and now he says we Timothy Silas and myself are asking you get a day job we have disregarded both of those calls 
Now he's telling the church what to do about it. That's step three. Guys, he doesn't want to go to step four. He wants restoration to take place because step four means that we not only disassociate ourselves from them, we treat them as Gentile unbelievers. Paul doesn't want that to happen in the church. He wants so desperately for these men, because primarily speaking in the masculine, he wants these men who refuse to get a job and they're able-bodied, just go get a job. We want to see you restored to Christ in the body. Well, what happens? Disfellowship, the first incentive. But I want to show you a beautiful picture that Paul chooses to do. Now, you don't think that for any, any way, shape, form, or fashion, Paul was so tuned to the work of God in his life that before he was ever called by the work of the Spirit to pen these two letters he already did something in their presence as an exemplar of what he's going to call them to right here. If you don't think that God was at work in Paul when he went into Macedonia, because guys, I'm going to tell you something. He had every right. Well, I'm, I'm not going to get ahead. Verse 7, I want you to secondly see, not only is there disfellowship as an incentive, but there's an example to follow as an incentive. Look at verse 7. For you yourselves, this is common knowledge. You know something about our ministry. He says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. He goes, you already know this, but in case you don't know this, I'm going to refresh your memory about the example that was left for you, but you already know this. Guys, he's not being uh, condescending in any way, and he's not taking a, a lesser route. He just says, look, you know this, and as soon as I start saying it, you're going to go, oh, yeah, 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 we know that. He says, this is the example that I want to remind you of. Well, what's the example? And it so happens that he picks himself and his other two traveling buddies. He goes, I'm just going to tell you, just from, hey, remember when we were there with you? What should they know and what should they remember as an example? Look at it. He says this, for you yourselves know that you ought to follow. That's pattern your life. Mimimoye, to mimic, you are to follow our example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined manner. What's he calling in verse 6? Quit being undisciplined. What was undisciplined? Not getting a job. He says, we did not act in an undisciplined manner. We got a job when we were there. Oh, that's right, you did. And then he says this about it. He said, we weren't undisciplined in the manner of the lifestyle among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Guys, I don't know how this worked. I don't know if Paul traveled around with uh, a kit, uh, a toolbox. I, I don't know. He had really good scissors or what, but he was a leather worker and he was a builder of tents. They worked with their hands. He could sew and he could pitch a tent. He knew how to make a tent and erect a tent. This is what Paul did. Well, Timothy, I don't know if he was a tent maker before, and I don't know. If, <coughs> pardon me. I don't know if Silas was a tent maker before, but I promise you, after they got off the missionary journey to Macedonia, they knew how to build a tent. <laughs> because Paul does not say to them, "And I was the example before you," and the other two guys sat against a rock and slept. We, plural, worked when we were with you. Why? Because we didn't want you to have to give us bread without us paying for it. Guys, they even stayed at Jason's house. We know the guy, according to Acts, they stayed at his home. But I'm telling you, they contributed to the well-being of Jason's home while they were there. Well, is that it? No, look at it. Look at verse 10. <coughs> Or verse 9, not because we do not have the right to do this or to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you that you might follow our example. Guys, does Paul say anything about a minister, a pastor, a shepherd that leads his flock well, that he should not be paid? 
He tells Timothy, a man who will present the gospel and be faithful to the word of God is worth double measure. Whatever the church says, they're gonna give you, double it. Wow, I would like to be in that business meeting as a pastor. Okay, well, you guys have agreed at this. I just wanna tell you, double. Here, Paul is sitting in the counsel of his own thoughts and he's writing this down and he gives an aha moment. (laughs) He goes, here's the deal. Disfellowship for the cause of getting a job and restoring that person to right standing with God. How about the example that was left for you? And every single person at Thessalonica went, oh yeah, oh yeah. He did make tents while he was here. Oh yeah, we did see those three guys in the marketplace and they were buying enough bread for themselves and they took it back to Jason's house and they labored together and toiled in faith as good stewards of the work God gave them. Guys, he stayed three Sabbaths in Thessalonica and this is where he would land. Don't you think of all the things that would be the highest level of example, the gospel Yes, did he not handle the word of truth correctly in the gospel? But guys, the very next thing that he did of a high water mark, he served them with his own work ethic. You say, what example is that? All right, how about we not talk about mom or dad or your boss? Let's just go straight to Jesus Christ. 33 years, he walked on the earth. 33 three years he was in full-time ministry the rest of the time he was a carpenter you tell me that he didn't work (laughs) you tell me he didn't get up and they had a a bill in order for them to engage in a work and that bill of sales said that they built this cabinet they built this house they built this furniture and they put it in the hands of the people who contracted with them he worked (laughs) even though the ground was cursed and even though he was going to have to sweat and even though there was thistles and there was briars and there were sticker bushes, he got up every day and he went to work. Let me just ask you about his ministry. When he strapped his sandals on his feet every morning, he didn't call an Uber. And I want you just to take a map one of these days and go from where he was birthed in a little town called Bethlehem, and you just look at the circuit of 33 years of ministry in the last three years of his life that he endured for the sake of our salvation, he walked. And when it came time for him to work, they went to work. He went in every highway, every byway, and if it meant going to a robber's den, he would go to present the gospel. If it meant going to a harlot, he would go in fellowship with that harlot so that they might be saved. He did not quit one bit. And when he was tired in his humanity, he did exactly in refreshment what you should do. He went straight to a place where he gazed into heaven and he cried to his father, Father, replenish me. Restore in me. Give me the strength to carry on. What was his prayer in the garden? What was it? Father, if there's any other way, remove this cup from me. But since there's not, that's the original text, your will be done. He took a beating, he was scorned sped upon a thorn of crowns crushed onto his forehead and as he's bleeding out they hand him his own cross from a piece of wood he created and under the weight of that wood he could not carry the burden any longer praise God for a traveler who in part shared in the journey with Christ but when it came down to the sacrifice he did not rely on anyone else but his father to see him through nailed pierced died rose again you don't think that was laborious 
But guys, the worst part of the whole story in the work of redemption, his father turned his back on his own son. Don't tell me how hard your job is. It's not that. And Paul says, look, just as an example from one guy to another, get a job. When I was there, I didn't ask for anything I didn't pay for. Neither did my running buddies. We paid for our bread. But then he leaves this as kind of a caveat. Not because we don't have the right. We do have the right. And the scripture is very clear that we have the right. But there's a third for survival. Go to work. Guys, I would love to see this on a bumper sticker. If you ever want to do anything for me and you just have a few minutes, give me a bumper sticker that reads this way. I'd be the only one in all the town that would have it. Because this is so foreign to what we say Christianity is. Disfellowship, we see. Example, we see. How about just get a job because it's survival at hand. Look at it in verse 10. For even when we were with you, I just want to take you back to that time again. Even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. We used to tell you this. This is kind of an axiom that we used to kind of throw around. This is our bumper sticker. This was on my walking cane. (laughs) If anyone will not work, neither let him eat. Man, you talk about incentive to get a job. If we stop that kind of nonsense just in the Western world of America and we stop the welfare of the able body, and we told them, look, you don't get an electric bill paid. You don't get a gas bill paid. You don't get a loaf of bread. If you don't go to work, you don't eat. I'm going to tell you something about our society. We would be the hardest working society in the world, or we would flat start out. That's the character that most exemplifies Christ. When you're able, if you don't, you don't get the benefit of somebody else's labor. Wow. What a concept. You mean if I go put in eight hours at the fair market value and I get eight hours of pay, that's the right thing to do? That's the right thing to do. Again, you want to teach your children a lifelong virtue that glorifies God every single time and is perfectly in the will of God, teach them to work. You don't work, an axiom. You remember we were with you guys, we always said this? Yeah, I remember that. You don't work, you don't eat? Yeah, I mean it. Freeloader? Enable? Sponge off of? You're in need, come here. This is a place of rest for you. We'll help you. But if you're able and you choose not to, not here. Disfellowship. Example. Survival. But look at verses 11 and 13. Harmony is at stake. Unity. Man, I'm I'm telling you, as we studied through the book of Philippians, one of the things we saw over and over and over to the church at Philippi, which is a part of this journey was he was concerned about their unity. He wanted them to be in unity and harmony with each other. Beginning in verse 11, it says this, for we hear, (laughs) that's not just gossip, that is a hearing with knowledge of fact. We know, we hear, that some among you, not all, but some among you are leading an undisciplined life. We've already defined what undisciplined is. You can work, you're able, and you choose not to. That's undisciplined. Do not work at all as a result of the undisciplined life, but acting like busybodies. What's the first thing you'll do if your idleness is your choice when you could get a job, according to this passage? You will turn your attention to everybody else's business but your own. You, I want to tell you something in the Greek. That is a play on words. Busy body. That's almost a laughing matter when you look at it in the original text they're busy they're as busy as they could be if they got a job but they choose not to get a job they're still busy doing what meddling in somebody else's business you know where the majority of gossip comes from idle people 
Guys, I'm gonna just tell you during the day, I get to work at seven o'clock in the morning and get home whenever we're done. I rarely have time to talk about anybody but the job that's at hand. You think about your day, those of you who are still in the labor force. You think about your life just in general, just to keep your household. And please don't look at me and say, well, are we talking about people? Is it the secular job? Folks, there's no such thing in Scripture as a secular job. It's all ministry as unto God. You're on the mission field 24-7 all your life as a believer. I don't care if you're mowing a lawn, you're washing a dish, you're sewing somebody's garment that's torn, or you're on the end of a shovel shoveling a ditch. You are on the mission field for God. All that I do, whether I eat or drink or whatever it is, I'm doing it to the glory of God. Quit looking at the title. Look at the provision that's commanded and be thankful that God has given you the grace to do it. People say, when are you going to retire? Folks, I have nothing wrong with retirement. Please don't read into this. Walk in and say, well, Rob's not for retirement. One of these days, I hope I get to walk away from the service center. But I don't want to ever work away from God and what he has for me. Because my dying breath, I pray that I'm standing up in a pulpit just like this and I'm preaching the gospel and God just takes me home. I hope the words of faithful are the next things I hear. But what I was doing whenever I expired was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. God would find favor. But more than that, I'd be blessed for it. And he looks at this, people. They're standing in the thralls, really, of church discipline. And he says to them, guys, some of you are doing this right now, and it's undisciplined. You broke rank. You're walking out of order. And I'm just asking you, in verse 12, well, leading in, quit being a busybody. Now, such persons we command and exhort you in the Lord, Jesus Christ, again, this is not coming from me, this is coming from God, to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Not to toot your horn. You guys are having peas and cornbread. I'm having ribeye because I have a better job. I can afford ribeye. Caviar's on my plate. I know that you're just having your toast. He says, whatever God provides for you, whatever bread he gives to you, would you just eat it in a quiet manner? Because this is the mercy of God. Did you have enough for your day? This is the grace of God put on uh, a magnificent platform that you would have enough to provide for you and your family. You know the best kind of job to have? One is the one who glorifies, the job that glorifies God most. But can I tell you secondly from a human perspective? The one that puts beans on the table. And shelter over your head. And a coat on your back on a cold day. That's the best kind of job to have. Isn't that what Christ promised? stand right here on the precipice of life and you look out across this field of lilies isn't that field beautiful yeah look at those lilies he says you see that bird right there in that nest not a single bird falls to the ground in death that I don't know he says you see that guy over there that has all that hair on his head yeah he says I know by number every hair on that guy's head if you don't think that I can dawn a field with lilies and account for every dead sparrow and count the very hair on your head, I can't give you shelter, clothing, and food. <laughs> really? He said, come on. Live a quiet life. And whatever God gives you, just buy your own bread and eat it. Quit being a sponge off of someone else. And then he leaves us with this. Look at 13. But as for you, brethren, here's the unity. Don't grow weary in doing good. When you see somebody in need and they're truly in need, don't, 
Don't say, well, I'm going to sit here and try to figure out, you know, are they able-bodied? Look, if God raises it up in your life and the life of your church, just give it to them. God will figure it out. But here's what I want you not to do. I don't want you to stop working because somebody else isn't working beside you. Don't grow weary and giving up. Guys, so how easy is it to look across the aisle and start picking the one thing that I can justify what I want to do in their error. Well, so-and-so does it. You guys heard this as, as children, I, I promise you. Your parents were just like my parents, just different head, different town. Oh, so if they jumped off a cliff, you'd jump off after them? Did you know that's exactly what Paul just told them? Because they don't go get a job, you're going to quit yours? Don't stop working. Don't quit. Disfellowship, an incentive, example, an, uh, an incentive, a survival, harmony. But lastly, the last one in 14, before he gets into the passage of love, is shame. And this is a hard passage to swallow. Guys, Paul used this terminology, and I know that those of you who study uh, scripture through the original language, you know that he chose some of the hardest words to explain 14. He is not playing around. You guys ever heard the term he took the gloves off? Yeah, we're bare knuckling now. He took the gloves off. And in 14, he says there's shame that might motivate some to get a job. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, it's the third time I've told you guys this. If this letter is read on any given Sabbath, and there are people who leave that congregation saying, well, I'm still not going to get a day job. If they don't take this instruction, what am I supposed to do? Take special note. That's to mark them out. That means that they have a S. They have a neon sign. Mark out. Take special note that that man with that man and do not associate with him so that he may be and here's the purpose put to shame is it to see the person fail no it's for restoration through shame you say Rob should we do that absolutely they've been told we've gone we've explained and they have snubbed their nose at scripture this is not personal to me Paul did not say if they reject my instruction he says the instruction when they reject the truth of the word of God the Lord Jesus Christ maybe their only hope is to have shame in their life guys I don't know too many churches that are practicing this I'll just be honest And I pray that our church right here in Ballinger when we can and when we are able we hold at a high measure the virtue of work. And then he leaves it with this. He calls us to love. In verse 15 he says and yet do not regard him as an enemy. You've disfellowshipped You've put him on notice and he's being shamed in it. But I'm asking you not to go to step four yet. Don't treat him as a Gentile yet. Don't treat him as an unbeliever yet. He's not your enemy. But admonish him as a brother. What's the motivation of 15? Love. Love for who? God first. Folks, isn't this what Jesus was being they were trying to entrap Jesus with with a lawyer a lawyer a man who understood the law comes to Jesus in the assembly of many people and he says okay Jesus I got one for you I heard you teach earlier this morning he goes okay shoot what what do you got he says I want you though you are a master in the law I'm being a lawyer. I'm part of the Supreme Court of Israel. I want to ask you a question about the law. 
He says, okay, you're asking me a question. What do you got? What's the greatest commandment? You know that Jesus is going, really? That's all you got? <laughs> That's like putting a ball on the tee and going, ah, see if you can hit that one. <laughs> he goes, out of the park. He goes, really, that's all you got? He says, just to be clear, you're asking me what the greatest commandment is. Go look at the dialogue in Matthew. He says to him, yeah, that's what I'm asking. What's the greatest commandment? He goes, okay. Love the Lord your God with the totality of who you are. Heart, mind, soul, spirit. And the guy goes, good, 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 you got it. Good one, Jesus. And so Jesus, the author, doesn't know the commands. And he goes, oh, but hang on just a second, Mr. Lawyer guy. I don't want to leave it at that. The greatest command is toward God in love to him. But the next one, number two, is lacking unto that. Love your enemy as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the brethren as you put whoever in there. You love like I love to those who are some lovely, some unlovely. That's the second command. And he says, hey, by the way, this one comes with a word of grace. This one, at times, it's going to cause you to love somebody you didn't want to love. How much do we love each other? Do we love, do we love God most? And before you say that, really take a really serious inventory of what that means. That means with the totality of who I am, I will do everything he asked me to do. Nothing more, nothing less. You love God? For those who love God, keep his commandments. And they are not burdensome. For his yoke is easy. His load is light. Why? He carries the burden of the yoke. You say, yeah, I love God. You love mankind? Sometimes. Do you pray for your enemies? Not very often. Do you serve the struggling? Not very often. Do you love your brother enough to go to him and say, get a day job? Because God would be glorified. Do you have a good work ethic? <sighs> Rob, is that meddling? Not in scripture. If you go with the right motivation, and the right understanding to see that brother or sister restored, you go in love because you love them that much. I watched my boys growing up and Zoe ready themselves and prepare themselves at times to do something that would have cost them in their life a consequence they didn't need to bear. And I love them. And you know what the manifestation of that love was? I warned them before they did it. Not after with I told you so. Guys, there's enough I told you so moments in life. You know that. You've done it. How about we warn them before they get there? How about we call it out before it becomes an I told you so? How much do I love you? How much do you love me? Would anybody dare this morning, if I was living my life in error according to Scripture, would you be in loving kindness and the mercy of the good God that we serve? Come to me privately and say, Rob, man, you've got to come out of that. That's not becoming of a believer. And I love God most. And I love my neighbor. And I love my neighbor like I love myself. And when I'm hungry, I feed myself. When I'm thirsty, I go get a cup of water. And I'm going to give you a piece of bread and a cold cup of water today. Rob, you can't live like that and put God on display. Come on. Repent and come home. 
Folks, at the time, I may hate to hear that. But under the conviction of the work of the Holy Spirit, if I turned and repented, you'd be the best thing that happened to me on that day. And we look at this as a negative. And Paul says, work's not negative. And calling a brother who won't work, that's not negative. Do you love me? Yeah. Do you love your neighbor? Yeah. Then let's act like it. Work hard today. Zoe can tell you, when she leaves the house or gets out of the car every morning, I say the same thing to her every time. We prayed for you this morning, Zoe, to have a good day. Work hard. I heard this from my college coach. And you know what? It played out correctly in all of my life. And he was a believer. He was one of the first guys that poured into me in discipleship, man. He was a great teacher of the word. And he told me one time, he says, Rob, hard work is a choice. Running fast is a gift. Perfect eyesight is a gift. Hand-eye coordination is a gift. And you don't have anything to do with that, pal. That's somebody else gave you that. But hard work, you'll choose today. Will I work hard or not? Give me a team. Give me an assembly of church members that have a work ethic. You can move mountains in Christ. And you say, well, we're not very talented. Really? God is our boss. How talented do you have to be? Well, we don't, I don't know that we have the resources. Guys, I want to just tell you something, and we didn't do this, but Paul makes reference to the church at Philippi two different times. They were a church that found themselves in poverty. And not only in Philippians, but in 1 Corinthians, he says to them, thank you for the gift you sent me. It's exactly what I needed. And when he got ready to go back to Jerusalem, those poor little churches that had nothing took up a love offering for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem because they were being persecuted and they got to take back a handsome amount of money there. Let this encourage you. The church is praying for you. Folks, does it matter how we live our life? Or is this just all rhetoric? Religious talk. If it matters, we'll obey it. Father, I thank you for this day. For the provision of your grace and salvation, that's where we want to start. For the beauty of that salvation resulting, Father, in the opportunity to do unto others as you would do to them and as we would want to be done to us and to love you and love you well. But Father, to love our neighbor as ourself. To love those that cross our path as we would meet our needs. Would we extend to them what is right? God, we're just asking that you would find us faithful. Father, I know that these sound harsh. But Father, in Christ, this is who we are as the body of Christ. Give us the mercy and grace and discernment to act, to see, and to do the things you've called us to. In Jesus' precious name we offer this prayer. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Well, there's a, a nice piece of meat to chew on all week, isn't it? <laughs> Great message, thank you. All right, we're going to close with Awake My Soul. If you'll stand and sing with us.
Be formed in 